Hello, welcome to Eye on Africa. I'm Rochelle Harrison Pless. Thanks for joining us. Coming up. Back where they started, thousands of Gambians who attempted to migrate to Europe in search of a better life are back on home soil. That's thrown up major challenges for the country's new government. Trouble is brewing for the Democratic Republic of Congo's main opposition alliance, the UDPS being torn apart by bitter infighting and divisions over who is the party's real leader. And the people of Cape Town are counting down to day zero when the taps in South Africa's second largest city will be turned off. As the most severe drought in over a century continues, local farmers are offering a helping hand. But first, back to square one. Thousands of would-be migrants from Gambia are returning home after being freed from Libyan prisons. Their dreams of reaching Europe shattered when they were thrown behind bars before even stepping off the continent. While the agonising ordeal is behind them, back in Gambia, they're frustrated, restless and struggling to find work. And that's put pressure on the country's new government. Nicolas Germain explains. African migrants in a detention centre in Libya. Many of them come from Gambia. They were robbed and beaten here. Last year, 2,500 Gambians were flown home by the IOM, the International Organization for Migration, after reports of Africans being sold in slave markets in Libya. Back in Gambia, life is hard. They face a youth unemployment rate of nearly 40 percent. We are all frustrated right now. And what I'm seeing, if there's no changes, I think that we just still have a stand as a man. God is there. God is there for us. We we'll still, you know, you know, push up the road again and see what God will do. There are limited opportunities available here. You know, there is nothing we can do. If there is something that we can do, also, it's taking time to reach us because still now we don't see anything. After 22 years in power, the authoritarian ruler Yahya Jame finally left last year. Adama Barrow won the election. He brought hope to many Gambians, but the economy is still not booming. The new authorities are relying on the help of foreign donors. We hope that we'll be able to receive um, support from our development partners, bilateral partners, and also put in uh, with our current policies with the uh, launching of the National Development Plan to, to provide a turnaround for our economy. After Adama Barrow's election, the European Union pledged 75 million euros in immediate funding and 150 million in the longer term. Money the government says is much needed, especially now with the return of migrants from Libya. A UNICEF aid worker has been killed during an attack in the Central African Republic. The UN Children's Agency said that five education officials also lost their lives. The team were attacked on Sunday while travelling in the country's remote northwest near the Chadian border. They were planning to train community teachers for some 2,000 children affected by the ongoing violence. The country has been rocked by deadly ethnic and sectarian fighting since 2013. Now, deeply divided and racked by infighting, the Democratic Republic of Congo's main opposition alliance is struggling to show a united front. Different factions within the UDPS can't agree on who should take the party reins. Bickering that could work in the ruling party's favour as President Joseph Kabila defiantly clings on to power. This report from our Kinshasa correspondent, Toma Nicolon. It's been more than one year since Congo's longtime opposition leader Etienne Chisikedi passed away. His political party, the UDPS, is still without a leader. Several members claim that one faction within the party has chosen his son to succeed him. The party's grassroots activists and Congolese people in general want to see Felix lead the party and even run for president. You can be sure of that. The country's current prime minister, Bruno Chibala, is a member of the UDPS, but he was dubbed a traitor when he accepted the job at the head of government alongside the ruling party. His allies say there is no leadership crisis. The late opposition chief's replacement has already been elected. Etienne Tshisekedi has been legitimately replaced by one of his colleagues and party co-founder, Bruno Chibala. No official text says one should become president of the party just because they're Etienne Tshisekedi's biological son. 
When the elections come around, the UDPS could well regret the infighting and internal divisions. The UDPS is fighting to survive, and other parties could win it all by being better organized and by taking the time to campaign in harmony. The DR Congo's political opposition must rebuild and reunite, but to do that, UDPS members must throw their support behind one man and one man only. Staying in the DRC, at least 14 people are missing after a convoy of overcrowded boats sank in the River Congo on Tuesday night. That's according to the country's interior minister. 108 people were rescued, but there are fears that hundreds more remain unaccounted for as local vessels rarely provide accurate passenger lists. Local officials say the rickety boats were struck by bad weather. Now, residents in Cape Town are bracing themselves for day zero, the day when the city's taps are turned off. This amid the region's worst drought in more than 120 years. The date was recently postponed until the 9th of July. As South Africa's second city goes dry, local farmers are coming to the rescue. Our correspondents Caroline Dumay and Stefan Carstens tell us how. This used to be one of the biggest lakes in the Western Cape province. But today, Tiervater's Kluft Dam is a sandpit. Only 10% of its water still remains. The drought has seriously impacted the groundwater reserves, and everybody fears the day the taps might run dry. So private farmers are jumping in to help municipalities. They collect data and lend their private infrastructure. We've done all we can, and I really want to reiterate the incredible sort of cooperation between ourselves and the water authorities on the other side. This farmers association is now releasing water from their private dams. Water that will travel through rivers to the main catchment areas. They are fortunate enough to live in a valley that has had more rainfall than anywhere else. On some of the private farms, lakes are still half full. As you can see, it's a vast collection area and catchment area. And we really do hope and pray that we get a good rain in the next few months that will build us back to where it was. But the surplus water that we have here is what allows us to do what we're doing here. And they are short of water in Cape Town, and therefore we have been able, with due good planning, to provide an extra 10 billion litres of water. This is not the first time this association has helped out. They release water each time the municipality needs it. But today, the flow is exceptional. It has allowed Cape Town to postpone day zero for a few more weeks. Busy releasing now at about nine and a half thousand cubic meters per hour. Uh, we started at the 6th of February and we probably will go on until the 8th, 9th of March. If rain does not come soon, other strategies will have to kick in. But in the meantime, this gesture from the private sector has brought a moment of relief. Their names are Simba and Saeed, two lions who've gone from the battlefields of the Middle East to an African sanctuary. The animal welfare group Four Paws rescued the big cats from zoos in war-torn Iraq and Syria. They were found emaciated, dehydrated and on the brink of death. After months of TLC, the pair have arrived in South Africa, a world away from the horrors of the front line. Take a listen. It's a sanctuary where where animals can at least live out the rest of their lives in peace. They've been through so much in so many different and difficult circumstances. They've been rescued by four paws from around the world, um, from zoos, from circuses, from terrible conditions. Uh, and now today, the most recent uh, rescue from terrible walk-torn conditions. And finally, the cotton harvest in Benin is in full swing, but suspicions are growing over a possible monopoly on the industry. The country is the fourth largest producer of what is known locally as white gold. With 2018 proving to be a bumper year for cotton growers, the sector is booming. But some farmers say not everyone is reaping the benefits. Companies with close ties to Benin's president, Patrice Talon, dubbed the king of cotton, have been accused of dominating the industry. Well, I'll be back uh, with more African news in about 45 minutes. Do stay with us here on France 24. More news coming up with Mark Owen.